Hey, good morning, everyone. I want to talk about something today that's pretty important for all of us outdoors enthusiasts, but no one likes to talk about. And so I've got a couple of experts here to share with this. I'll let them introduce themselves, but we're going to be visiting with a couple of researchers from Oklahoma State University. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Each of you introduce yourselves and tell us what you've been up to. Uh, my name is Bruce Noden. I am a medical veterinary entomologist, which basically means I'm interested in any arthropods that are sucking blood from people or their animals or their wildlife. And I'm interested in how um, arthropods are spreading pathogens and diseases across particular landscapes. That's my, my focus. And I'm Scott Loss. I'm a professor in the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management here at OSU. I have a lot of different research projects and most of them focus on birds and wildlife and how they interact with the human world. And one aspect of this that's bringing me in to collaborate with Dr. Noden is how they're potentially contributing to carrying birds, contributing to carrying ticks, including in relation to this issue of Eastern red cedar encroachment into grasslands. Yeah, guys, that's a big issue. So I, I've shared before, but it's, it's not widely known, but the numbers that the state of Oklahoma puts out is that they lose about 700 acres a year to cedar encroachment. And that's, when I say that in seminars, some people, are, I can't, you know, I think they think of one 700 acre block, but if you take the state of Oklahoma and cedar seed being dispersed here and there and yonder, it's pretty easy to understand without good treatment. Of course, prescribed fire or wildfire back in the day is what kept cedar at bay. And when we've excluded that, cedars are really spreading. Is that true? Yeah, certainly. A lot of our prairies and shrublands and even more open oak woodlands are being encroached upon by eastern red cedar, especially in this region. It's an issue also like going on Great Plains wide and even worldwide in, in open grasslands and savannas, this issue of woody plant encroachment. Well, all it takes is a trip up I-44 there in Missouri, and you, you've got the issue as well. Oh, we do. We do. And unfortunately, a lot of people here just believe cedars are always here. And I point them back to some of the early explorers that went through here, almost like Lewis and Clark, but smaller scale, obviously. One guy that went right through my area was looking for sources of lead, and he kept a journal like Lewis and Clark. And a couple of things he never mentions in the journal, which I find fascinating, is ticks one? Or if you walk through, you know, 100 miles of the Ozarks now, you would talk about ticks unequivocally. You would talk about ticks, but and Lewis and Clark, of course, don't mention ticks. Most of these are explorers never mention ticks, and they don't mention the preponderance of cedars. They talk about species and all the native grass and the woodlands and the savanna habitat. They don't talk about cedars. So we've lost that component of our habitat, which let more sun in didn't make as friendly of an environment for ticks as cedars do. So share with, you know, what you see in Oklahoma and how this cedar encroachment is actually causing a lot of ecological changes. When uh, a gra open grassland or a shrubland or an oak woodland, like a savanna type woodland, um, experiences eastern red cedar encroachment, there is a wide range of changes that happen from just the condition, the abiotic or weather type conditions, like the, the moisture, the, the air moisture, the relative humidity of the soil and the air makes it more humid year round on average under these trees, uh, can change the wind conditions, can change the temperature, solar radiation, all things which influence uh, vectors like ticks, like Dr. Noden studies, as well as wildlife, right? Will change the way different species of wildlife use the landscape as well. Yes, exactly. And that shading factor changes the plant communities drastically. So for the deer hunters, uh, like myself included, we're going from a forb and grass habitat to a shaded out habitat, which is a significant reduction in habitat quality and, and antler size, by the way, because we're just reducing the amount of groceries. But that higher moisture content and shade is very favorable for ticks. And I like to share that we manage populations of wildlife by managing the habitat, not the critter necessarily. And we're making very favorable habitat by allowing this to happen for ticks. We're expanding those populations by allowing this habitat to change from a hostile environment to ticks to one more favorable. Do y'all agree with that? No, you're, you're correct about the, the open spaces. You know, the sun comes in, the air starts moving, it dries out the leaf litter, 
And you know that there's nothing that a tick fears more than than dry air. And you know if you if we can create spaces where the where the air is dry, then ticks they, they're going to die because they can't handle the the low humidity. And so what these plants are doing is it just creates these zones of higher humidity across the landscape, which gives them the capacity to live. You know, it's the deer that are moving the ticks around. You know, we just we know that. Um, sure. But the question is, when they do, when they fall off of a deer, are they going to fall into a habitat where they can actually survive and lay their eggs and and live? And normally, in particularly in western Oklahoma where it's dry, we've said no. You know, it's been dry. The, the ticks fall off the deer. They they start looking for a place to lay eggs. They lay their eggs. They dry out because it's dry. But now we have red cedar. Deer tend to associate with red cedar in, in a lot of these different areas. The ticks drop off. It's a favorable habitat, and boom, we get we get the, the connection between them. Yeah, that's great information. And I want to add there, I do work in western Oklahoma out at Blair and places like that. And a lot of people don't know this, but there's a lot of either open land or even wheat land out there. So the areas that aren't tillable or used or grazed heavily uh, end up being cedar, so that's the cover. Deer go there for cover. Now, that's not saying cedar's good cover. It's like, you know, yeah. I don't necessarily want to eat snail for dinner, but if I haven't eaten in three or four days, snail might sound pretty good. Yeah. So deer are using these cedar patches out there because that's the best cover around. It's, yeah. We're not saying that cedar's good cover. It's just the best cover in that habitat. And, and then deer go in that shaded, humid environment and tick shed off the deer, and voila, we got an active tick population. So you're seeing this, do I understand correctly, you're seeing this trend of tick populations increasing in density and geographic spread going from east to west across Oklahoma. Is that correct? We think we are. Um, we, I mean, we definitely know here in central Oklahoma where, where we have the, you know, the cross timbers, where we, we have the post oaks, but we also have the, the eastern red cedar. You know, our populations of ticks are quite a bit more um in our red cedar areas but we we're, we're hoping part of the project that we're on now is to see whether you know we see this gradient effect and and we're, we we feel like we are in some ways seeing fewer and fewer ticks as you move west but we're still getting ticks all the way out to you know woodward wow yeah i know woodward yeah yeah that's that's discouraging in some ways yeah uh, would you have any idea that, you know, if you're a landowner in those areas and you implement restoring native habitat, you're eradicating a lot of cedars, you're introducing fire, you're creating that savanna habitat, maybe in the post oaks area, but your neighbors are not, are deer going to keep dropping enough ticks in there? Or when you create that environment with less humidity, less moisture, will there be do you think, hypothetically speaking, there could be fewer ticks on that property than there could be on a neighbor properties that are, you know, crowded out with cedar trees? Can you make a difference on a smaller property? Yeah, so that's really, uh, we do have evidence, especially from Dr. Noden's past work, you know, that compared to being under an eastern red cedar tree versus an open grassland next to it, that you're more likely to find ticks, like especially Lone Star ticks under those cedar trees. But on like the sort of broader landscape, I think that's one of the directions where our research is going. We've scaled up a little bit and sampled at broader sites that have different stages of eastern red cedar encroachment, as well as open grasslands, in hopes of comparing like a sort of broader landscape with different stages of encroachment, what that will mean for ticks across that broader area. We don't have, you know, final answers yet. And I think that would be a really crucial question to address, like how much of, of an area would need to have eastern red cedar control and restoration of these grassland, shrubland, and or savanna conditions to like cut them off sort of on an even broader, say like a county level, right? But it's certainly removing eastern red cedar or reducing its cover should at least have local scale effects, we think, on the property where it's done. That might not prevent ticks from being on the neighbor's land, right? And there may occasionally be ticks dropped off from the, from the cedar areas nearby. By moving animals like birds, small mammals, deer, etc. Um, but any amount of, of restoration would contribute to making a difference, I would think, from a, a disease, tick-borne disease perspective. That's great information. And I think maybe another way to 
look at that is ticks, from my understanding, desiccate pretty quickly. So I'm sure you guys know a little bit about that. Share with us, you know, if we took a vial of ticks, heaven forbid, and, you know, poured it out there in a, a hostile environment for ticks, that open grassland savanna habitat, does that significantly reduce your life expectancy because they're in that desiccated habitat? I don't think there's been a study where we've just dumped ticks out there. I think we've done the converse where we've actually taken ticks and put them into a humid area. And uh, I don't know if you know, but the Cookson Hills area near Tahlequah, uh, well, my predecessor took um, basically um, recently fed ticks, nymphal ticks, and he put them out there and put them in cages, just environmental cages and left them. And he ran out of funding after three years. So he had to stop the, the, the study. But at the end of three years, 29% of the ticks were still still alive. So that oh tells you that the high humidity of eastern Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma is enough to keep li ticks alive for over a thousand days. Um, conversely, uh, we know that one of the things that, that really moderates tick activity is their loss of, of body water. Their, you know, the, and so essentially they go out in the morning, you know, you usually encounter a tick about eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock. They'll get out there, they'll they'll quest for a while on the edge of the grass, they'll, they'll dry out, and then they have to go back down into the leaf litter. And then they they, they can pick up water from the environment. And so they, they go down there, they pick it up, and they may come out in the evening or they may take a couple of days. But yeah, they're heavily, heavily influenced by the humidity. And when we're talking water needs, is that keeping their exoskeleton moist or is this their ingesting this water? It's actually a percentage of water in their body. Um, you know, it, it, if they get below 70% um, water load, then they, they, they're at risk of dying. So they get out there, they quest for a while. They sense, uh oh, you know, I'm drying out here. I need to. That's that's actually one of the reasons why we run into sea ticks in groups, not individually. You okay. Know, ticks, you, you you hardly ever get one sea tick. You usually get a you know a big bomb of them on your leg or something, and that's because they quest in groups. They actually quest in a clump, and by being in a clump on the edge of grass, they actually keep their humidity higher, and they can be out there longer, looking for, you know waiting for a host rather than being, because individual tick larvae are very, very uh, sensitive to, to humidity. Yeah, we notice that we do get those bombs of seed ticks. We actually take, keep duct tape in our work vehicles and whatnot, and we're rolling up right. But if we get a bunch of ticks, we reverse it and yeah. just pat ourselves or our pants or whatever. And you're good. I mean, you're turning that tape, you know, from gray to brown pretty quickly when you get a big load of seed ticks on you. I, I worked for Squidus uh, South Seas and Wildlife Dees Cooperative when I was in grad school. And we had a tick study at the Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge and we would put dry ice out and, you know, count ticks coming to it for X minutes or whatever on a meter square of white paper. And I can remember the, the professor told us to wear white painter pants. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to work, man. I'm going to wear blue jeans, not white painter pants. <laughs> the first day I learned, because those students who did follow the professor's hint or white painter pants. And of course they could see the ticks on them instantly. And my blue jeans did not quite show the ticks as much, but we almost collected as many ticks off of us standing there waiting for them to get on the white plastic sheets so we could count them and catalog them. They were picking us up on the way to that dry ice. And by the way, as you can all can explain why dry ice attacks attracts ticks to our audience out there. Why does dry ice serve as an attractant for ticks? Um, dry ice is essentially gives off carbon dioxide and carbon yeah. dioxide is exactly what we exhale. So it's basically like you sleeping in a bush and just breathing or a deer, you know, breathing in a bush. Dry ice acts the same way. Yeah. So what I want to share, we're going to end up after this, but you know, we put just a little chunk of dry ice on a white sheet of plastic and it, as it melts or breaks down, that's just like we're respirating or a deer laying there respirating and the white plastic so we can see them easily. And we would collect them on masking tape. It's not as sticky as duct tape or something. Take it back to the lab, use a dissecting microscope to, you know, count gender, all that stuff for that research project. But you think about, a you know, a four to six pound fawn 
that's pretty immobile for the first couple of weeks of his life. Well, that's like that dry ice block, just continually exhaling. And in bad tick areas, I think it's underrepresented the amount of fawns that are killed by ticks coming to those fawns. Mm -hmm. And they're pretty much immobile for the first couple of weeks of their life. So this is another reason to do good habitat work and reduce the tick populations if you're into, into white-tailed deer because everyone's, and I do too, but talking about coyotes or other predators, but oftentimes by mass, by weight, the most populous predator out there may be ticks by weight per acre. Mm. And if you think about, you know, a couple of coyotes and a coon, you know, whatever that weighs together, 40, 50, 60 pounds, whatever it is, you know, there could be way more pounds of ticks out there per acre. Uh, and so it's, I think tick, the research y'all doing is invaluable to the people that enjoy the outdoors. I've had a rickliosis. I've, I personally had Rocky Mountain spotted fever with rickliosis. So I'm very sensitive to ticks and I don't mind wearing light colored pants when I'm out in the field these days. Yeah. Yeah. And so Dr. Nodens and my collaboration actually started sort of randomly. We were both new faculty members here at OSU and we happened to be at a function together and he told me what he studied. I had a little bit of research interest in it, but not much to date, but I did have the personal interest of having caught Rocky Mountain spotted fever my first year living here in Oklahoma, as well as Lyme disease when I had done field work in uh, Wisconsin previously. So, and I'm sure there's many viewers, especially from this region, from the Southeastern US, who are gonna have similar stories about having themselves or knowing someone else who's gotten one of these tick-borne illnesses or increasingly we're getting the, the alpha-gal um, oh, yeah. uh, bacteria, which causes the red meat allergy, which is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. I think maybe there's some confusion about ticks and life cycles. I get some questions sometimes. Well, I got that species of seed tick on my property. So if you don't mind, would you just walk us through the life cycle of common species of ticks we would expect here in the Midwest and kind of how they go through that progression? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, one of the, uh, our, the, most of the ticks that we have here in the Midwest are we call three host ticks. And so the, basically that means that each stage of the development feeds on a different host. And so, so when, a, when a female tick drops off of a deer, she'll, she'll usually do it in a habitat that is, is conducive to her babies surviving. And she'll drop off the deer and she will put out five to 10,000 eggs. And those eggs all get put into one particular area, which is why you get sea ticks all at once, because they all hatch together. And so basically when those eggs hatch, they, they come out of the eggs and they start looking for a, a host. You know, a host will come by depending on the tick. Um, you know, if you're if you're uh, an American dog tick, black uh, black legged tick, you know they'll be on on smaller mammals or reptiles. Uh, lone star ticks don't care; they'll get on birds, they'll get on deer. It doesn't matter what stage. Um, so the seed ticks or these larvae larval ticks get on a host, they feed, and they'll drop off into a habitat. Then they will molt and become a nymph. And that nymph is, is not sexually active. It's basically got um, four legs. It's got eight legs. And that stage then, again, is going to find a host, is going to feed on that host, going to drop off of that host, and then it will molt. And that's when we get this the, the sexual dimorphism, where we get the males and the females. So you go see ticks, feed, molt, nymphs, feed, molt, adults, and then the, the males and females then will feed and it keeps the life cycle going. And that whole cycle will take two years. And so it uh, it's really important to, and then as I said before, some of these ticks are actually gonna live for years. So you can have generations and generations of ticks happening in your backyard. And the takeaway related to seed ticks, I guess, is that that's not a species, that's a life stage, right? So it could be any number of species that you're encountering in that sort of seed tick stage. Yeah. What's a common tick predator? What, what eats ticks? That many of our wild bird species can eat, eat ticks. It may not be a major food source for most birds, but there's a lot of our insectivorous birds that eat 
gross things like spiders and millipedes, et cetera. Right? And there's evidence that they'll, they'll eat ticks too, including off of themselves. For most of the species of ticks we find on birds, they show up right around the head. Um, not all species, or almost many birds carry bird ticks all over their body, but um, suggesting that the birds are able to find the ticks and pull pull and preen them off. They probably eat some. There's evidence that they they have ticks in their diet as well. Yeah, I can remember a publication a few years ago about wild turkeys consuming some ticks, probably from grooming. And if you watch wild turkeys, they're grooming all the time. They're preening in between individual feathers and whatnot. So you've explained the life cycle of ticks. How could you disrupt that life cycle? Watch some actions that we could take to potentially disrupt that life cycle. Well, anytime that we can, we can uh, dry them out. You know, we've talked about the fact that they're very sensitive to drying. So, you know, burning, opening up land, that kind of thing is going to be is going to be something that you're going to break the cycle. You have a better chance of doing something to that tick while it's waiting to for another host or molting and it'll dry out. So that's why burning is good. Opening up your land, you know, getting the cedar off of it. Um, that's all going to help to to create an environment where the ticks are not going to survive well. I think an intriguing idea that it, I don't believe it's been researched is that the larval tick or the seed tick season comes near the end of the summer, right? And there's increasing, you know, increasingly we know of some benefits of, of thinking about growing season burns. There's evidence that fire, whenever it happens, may actually cause some direct mortality of ticks, right? It changes the habitat in ways that disadvantages ticks, but some of them also will just be directly killed by the flame. And the a neat question to potentially ask is whether the growing season burns might potentially be able to directly kill some of these seed ticks. But as far as I know, we don't necessarily have an answer for that in our region. You know, when I was a boy, I heard frequently, oh, we had a late frost this year. Ticks won't be bad, but it seems like they were always bad. So can you address whether potentially a late frost might significantly set back tick populations? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that we know is that um, particularly sea ticks are, are you know, the, the larval ticks are quite sensitive to temperature. So if you can, if that frost can happen, you know, it normally will knock down the, the, the larval ticks more than the other ones. The nympho and adult ticks are more, are, are able to, they, you know, they can get into the bases of the roots of the grass, or they can get underneath that leaf litter. I mean, I've, I've had ticks that are literally dirty. They, ha they have dirt all over them because they've been so stuck down in there. And often, you know, that frost, we think about it because it coats our car, but you know, that, that frost line's got to get into the soil and into the leaf litter under those trees in order to make a difference. And that's why we don't see the difference is because you know, the trees create this environment where the frost isn't going to affect them as bad so especially a cedar tree like we've been talking right you know you almost never see frost under a cedar tree so that's just another reason to snip those rascals off and put a fire in there because it's a safe haven for ticks during that situation well jim and owen thank you so much for your time today of sharing with us your work and i, I would ask you to you know when you're a little bit further down the road have a little bit more research you could share, maybe come back and share those results with us, put some more checks in the boxes there. We'd look forward to hearing that and helping educate other people that enjoy the outdoors of how we can work or encourage our state agencies and federal agencies to manage land. And, and I find that when we restore habitat to native habitat, what these early explorers wrote about, there are many benefits to the whole system. And one of those benefits is reduced tick populations. Yeah. You know, there's just lots of mounting research from this region, a lot at our university here and other universities showing that this Eastern red cedar encroachment obviously affects livestock production because it takes up grassland. It's affecting potentially water tables and water runoff to streams because it, it uses a lot more water than, and it intercepts a lot more water. Um, it, when it gets to a late stage, it creates a wildfire risk, right? So yes. there's a lot of and the, the disease risk that Dr. Noden has shown over the last few years and that we're looking at is just another sort of important reason to consider restoring back away from eastern red cedar dominated areas to grasslands and our savannah, native savannas. I, I agree. Native savannas, a very beautiful and productive habitat and probably a little safer for 
fire tick and a lot of other reasons also. Gentlemen, thank you again. We're looking forward to staying in touch and hearing from you as uh, as time goes by and your research gets another notch down the road. Thanks for the good work you're doing and have a great day. Okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Very much. Common theme I find so much antler health, tree health, you know, diversity of plant species and reduction of ticks is restoring habitat to what the early explorers saw, what was here before early settlers started manipulating the habitat. And in this case, removing or stopping the encroachment of eastern red cedar and reintroducing fire, replicating those fires that Native Americans said were caused by lightning strikes, creates a better, healthier environment for wildlife and for humans. You know, studying how we're supposed to be really goes back to studying the Creator's Word and applying it to our lives. And I think just like we can create healthier habitat, we can have better lives and help more people if we apply His Word to our life daily. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.